will discuss on three schema architecture, data independence and models inside a database management system. Data models, I think you can read it on your own. What is the difference between hierarchical network and object relational models? So we will look at uh, some definitions. Database state. What is a database state? It refers to the data at a particular moment inside the database. If you take a snapshot of a student management system, at this moment we will have the data of the students with the attendance status, mark status. All right. After CAT1, if you take a snapshot of the VTOP, the data might have changed because we would have uploaded your marks and attendance. So, database state refers to content of a database at a moment in time. It's a snapshot of the database. And uh, what is the valid state of a database when the data satisfies all the constraints and the structure? So, you have some valid data. There is a difference between database schema and database state. Schema is the structure you define for the tables, right? So, database schema will not change frequently, whereas state changes frequently. Schema is also called intention, state is also called extension. So, this is an example for schema. Okay, we have so many schemas here. And this is an example for database state. You see that data is captured. And it denotes the state of the database at that moment in time. Three schema architecture. The three schema architecture was proposed to support uh, two important things program data independence and multiple views of the data. For instance, you have a faculty table. Students can view only the faculty name and phone number. They should not be able to view the salary or other details of the faculty. Whereas, a supervisor of the faculty should be able to view all the other details of the faculty. So, multiple views on the data, how it's going to be supported. So, for this, they thought about this three schema architecture. So, you have three levels. One is the external view. The intermediate level is the conceptual level. The third level is the internal schema. Say, if you are talking about this faculty table, you go and create the schema for the faculty, right? So, you have, say, you have faculty ID, uh, faculty name and salary. Say one of the views that will be generated is say a student can view only the ID and name of the faculty. Whereas this guy is a supervisor, so he can view ID, name, and salary for the faculty. So you are projecting two different views on the existing schema. So that is the conceptual schema, and these are the views. So this guy can view ID, name, and salary, three columns on the table. This guy can view only two columns. What is this internal schema? How your data is stored on the hard disk? We can be using some storage structures, data structures, and uh, you can have a lot of indexes for retrieval. So, it defines how the organization of data happens at the very internal level. Okay. So, another uh, view of this, you know, you can also understand free schema architecture like this. So, this is the conceptual level and we build some views so that becomes the external level. When you talk about the internal level, it's all about data structures, indexes and how it is organized. Okay. There are two more things that you have to understand. That is, they use two important uh, terms, logical data independence and physical data independence. What does that mean? What is logical data independence? Say, if I go and create this totally, what you are seeing on the board, this is created, then I go and add a column here. Some column I am adding because of my business demands, but that doesn't mean that I should go and change my views. If it is needed, I should go and change my views, but until and unless it is needed, there is no such thing that if I change this, I have to go and change this, right? That becomes logical data independence, logical data independence. What does that mean? If I change my conceptual schema, it is not mandatory for me to change my external views. Likewise, there is one more thing called physical data independence. What does that mean? So, if I go and change anything at the internal level, there is no need for me to change this conceptual schema. For instance, if I go and create an index for faster retrieval, there is no need for me to change the conceptual schema. If I go and run a compression algorithm, so if I compress my data in the database, doesn't mean that I have to go and change my concept scheme. So, this is called physical data independence. If I change the internal level, there is no need for me to change the conceptual level. Let us uh, go and take a demo of this. I will show you what, what 
kind of demo we are going to see now. So we take, uh, say there is one user, he is the faculty uh, himself. Say he is creating the faculty table. We will take this, he is having ID, name, address and salary. And then what we are going to do is, we are going to have a student. So student is another user. This user should be able to view only the ID and say name of the faculty, not his address or salary. So here, this there should be an external view, that is external view generated. That should be having only ID and name. So this external view is directly projected from the existing table. So like that you can create many views. So if I go and change, if I go and add another column here, say I, I add uh, uh, say department ID column here for the faculty, there is no need for me to go and change this external view. So that means there is a logical independence, data independence between these two levels. So we'll just go and uh, create, so we'll call this user as Satish, uh, we'll create this faculty table. We'll have another user Ram uh, and uh, he will be given access to view this one particular uh, data. So let's see how this one works here. Let's go and uh, uh, say I have logged in as uh, Satish. So user is Satish here. So how to go and uh, create this faculty table? Say let me drop table. If I have created any faculty table earlier. Let me drop it. So create table faculty and then uh, we'll have only two things. ID to be of type, number, name, uh, where, where, and then we'll have this uh, salary details uh, to be a type number. That's it. We'll have three columns for simplicity. We'll insert some values here. So we'll say insert into faculty values. So uh, say ID is uh, one two three. It's number type name is we'll have it as Satish. And then we'll have uh, salary to be some twenty thousand. So we have the faculty record now. We have to log in as this uh, user. Say we'll take uh, the user Chris. So this user Chris is a student who should be able to only view the name and ID of the faculty. So how will you log in as uh, uh, user Chris? For that we have to first go and create this user account Chris. So we have to log in as system DBA. Say my I log in as this DBA here. So so I'm connected as a sys DBA now. And I will create a user called Chris. So create user Chris identified by password Chris. So user is created. Once when I have created this user, say I have to grant him some initial privileges. Say I grant one privilege, grant create session to Chris. So Chris user can log into his system and he can, you know, check the tables. So let us log in as Chris. So let me connect as Chris here. Now Chris has connected. Now will you be able to see the uh, table faculty table by user Satish? Select star from faculty. Now Chris is trying to access faculty. Teacher's table of view doesn't exist because he is not authorized to view what uh, this faculty has created. So how can he actually view this uh, table? Say okay, if he tries to do this, select star from say we normally give the username Satish dot table name. This table name is faculty. Let me try it this way. Still, he is not able to view. That is some kind of uh, security, right? So now, Satish feels okay. We have to give him the permission to view only ID and name from my call, from my table. So what Satish should do is he should first log in. Let me connect a Satish here. So the user is Satish, right? So I am connected as Satish. See, I can view the tables. Select star from username is Satish. Faculty is the table name. So I am able to view the table here. Now I want to give access to Chris. Before that I will create a view. How will I create a view? Create view. View name is, uh, say I will give uh, faculty view. As select id, comma name from uh, faculty. So that is a view created. And what is there in this view? Select star from uh, faculty view. So this view, I should grant access to Mr. Chris. How will I grant access to Mr. Chris? Grant select, only you can view the data from this view. Grant select on faculty view to user Chris. 
So I have granted him the permission. Now Chris can see the data here. So what is this view? We are not giving a separate memory to store ID and name. This is a dynamic uh, execution. Say every time this view, somebody wants to view something, this query will be executed on the existing table and data will be retrieved from there. So now what happens is uh, Chris should log in. So let us log in, connect as Chris. Chris is connected. So he just tries to select star from, uh, we have to give the username. Satish is the user. And then what is the view? Back view. We can view ID and name of the faculty. If he tries uh, viewing the faculty table itself, select star from Satish dot faculty. Uh, if he tries, he's not given access. So this is how you create an external view on an existing table and give permissions to different users so that they can view different sets of data on the conceptual level. The next thing is if I go and change the faculty table, if I add another column, will this view get uh, impacted? Should I change anything else? So let me go and again connect as Satish. That is logical data independence, right? So we will connect as Satish. We have this table here. Select the star from faculty. So I'll go and add this uh, school uh, column to this particular uh, table. I'm just changing the conceptual level schema here. So how would you do this? Alter table faculty. Add which column we are going to add. We are going to add the school column. Say it's of type webcast. Okay. So I have altered the conceptual schema. If you go and check the faculty, you might have another column added here. So school is added. Will this impact this view on the table? So we will go and see how this is getting impacted because of this. So select star from say it's Satish dot view right. So it's not getting disturbed. So that is called logical data independence. If you just go and create an index on the uh, faculty table, you are altering the internal level. Uh, you know how you are going to retrieve it. There is some changes to that. So can you go and create an index? So for that you have to connect a Satish because uh, Satish is having the view. You know all the rights on the table. So will you create an index on the table? Say if I want to create index on the uh, ID column, how can I create? One way to create an index is you make that uh, ID to be the primary key. Automatically an index gets created internally. A B plus B gets created. So how can you go and define that to be a primary key there? Alter table, faculty, add constraint. The constraint name is you can think of uh, ID that is faculty underscore ID underscore PK. And then you say primary space key on the ID column. So if you go and describe this uh, table faculty, you're going to see there is this not null constraint. So automatically an index gets built on the primary key column. But that doesn't affect this in any way. That doesn't affect your conceptual schema in any way, right? No changes to be done. If you take a look at this uh, faculty table, it's still there. We connect as Chris and the Chris and you try it out. Select star from Satish dot uh, view. You still can access it, no matter what you do to your internal levels. So these three uh, levels of independence, we call that logical independence and physical data independence. So if they ask you what is the three schema architecture, you write this. If they ask you what is three tier architecture, you talk about uh, client, web server, and then database server. That's a three tier architecture. When you talk about DPMS internal architecture. We should go and talk about this, uh, this famous diagram. So this talks about the internal modules inside DBMS. I will share these slides with you, but a very brief look into the modules inside DBMS. Say at the lowest level, we have the stored data manager. And even before that, anything that is getting into the DBMS, it's getting stored on the hard disk. So you call this to be the stored database. So everything is on the hard disk. So how will you go and access data from the hard disk? You need an operating system. So operating system is in charge of handling all your external uh, devices, right? So this stored data manager will be having an interface with your operating system. So operating system and stored data manager is responsible for fetching data from the hard disk. That's at the lowest level. You also have the system catalog and data dictionary. 
what is the use of this you are creating so many schemas you are creating so many constraints foreign key primary key constraints you are, so you are creating so many indexes that should be all this data metadata stored right what is the definition for employee table what are the indexes on employee table what are the constraints on employee table so all this data will be stored in the data dictionary that that contains the metadata of your tables and uh, you have this concurrency control and backup recovery system this is where the algorithms for maintaining concurrency so many users want access the same data item how will you lock the data item which user you are going to allow so all those algorithms and backup and recovery protocols those things are stored in this module concurrency control backup recovery systems so runtime database processor is responsible for running the query on the database using all these modules so data manager concurrency backup recovery module and data dictionary so before running a query what it will do is it will first go and check this data dictionary whether the table definition exists so if you are trying to access something that is not there it will say table or view doesn't exist after referring to this data dictionary so that is at the very internal level and uh, on the outer level you have the different types of users right who are the users we have seen dbs casual users application programmers and parametric users dbs are responsible for giving data definition language commands or privileged commands this will be given to a ddl compiler which compiles it so dbs will be creating table or creating indexes and things like that right so that definition will be given to dictionary so dictionary will store all this after compilation of your queries ddl queries casual users or users like this who will use a sql plus like tool interactive tool to query the database so we will be running some report so you will have a query compiler which will compile your query and then it will be given to a query optimizer just now i was telling you this query optimizer is responsible for making some internal decisions on how to retrieve data at a faster level so this query optimizer will be you know optimizing the query finally that will be given to the runtime database processor for running it on the hard disk the third uh, type of users application programmers what application programmers do they will be writing say a c program you are going to write inside your c program you will have this sql query so you will have c statements and you will have some sql queries also so this should be handled in a different way the c program statements will be given to the host language compiler or the c compiler if you write it in c we'll say it's c compiler so all your c statements will be compiled here whereas sql will be separated and then it will be given to dml compiler data manipulation language compiler so both these compiled statements will be merged together to create a load it becomes a compiled transaction so you can see the parametric users in the bank right mostly tellers will be using it for withdrawal or deposit of money so what they are going to do is they are just going to enter two parameters one is amount and then on which account id so this compile transaction will be directly executed on the database using those two inputs so such users are called parametric users and that's how it works this is a very very high level view of the internal modules in a database management system okay that's it i'll be sharing this slides i have some material given here all this material is from your textbooks one textbook i have referred is also given on the slides fundamentals of database management systems by elmas ri and navadeep